Okay, continue. Today's lecture, I want to first finish up discretization. I want to talk about aliasing and anti-aliasing. Then afterwards, I'm going to talk about uh, the LQG, LTR, which is kind of a application of many topics we have learned so far. There are several interesting things will happen over there. But today, for the LTR part of lecturing, I will only talk about the big pictures. And on Thursday, uh, we will talk about the detailed proofs of the results over here. Okay. Let's do a quick review of the sampling theory which we have learned last time. Okay. So there's a key result, Shannon's sampling theory. Okay, which is saying if you want to recover the frequency omega of a continuous time sinusoidal signal, you have to sample enough points to be able to recover this frequency. So it's like it's like you, you are a regular visit to a restaurant. You have to visit the restaurant for a sufficient amount of times to let the restaurant uh, remember you. You can't go like, I go there every 10 years. It's, it's, they won't be able to recognize you at all. Okay? You, you can't do that. Okay, this is, for example, this is the period of you visiting to the restroom, restaurant. 10 years. Doesn't make sense. He will guarantee it not remember you. You have to visit there for a sufficient amount of time. And for this particular case, you have to visit there. The, the period of your visit in the restaurant has to be uh, here. Has to be this, this one. This is the minimum, minimum period you have, you have to take to let the restaurant remember you. And this, this is called the, uh, if I say sampling time is Ts, then you have to visit there. Uh, this freak, if the sampling time is Ts, and the frequency of this sinusoidal is omega, then the period of this sinusoidal is going to be 2 pi divided by omega. So it's saying you have to, within one period, you have to visit 1, 2, 3. If I count these marginal points at, at, as a visit, you have to visit there at this is a sufficient amount of times. If you visit there for just two, two points, then you're losing, you're losing. The restaurant will, will forget you because the restaurant wouldn't be able to tell whether you are a sinusoidal signal at this frequency or you are not a sinusoidal signal at all. You can be as simple as just a constant value. All right? So that's a sampling theorem. And uh, it's kind of not, not very difficult to, to get the intuition if you draw this kind of pictures and see how it goes. All right? So over here, we discussed something called a Nanquist frequency. Nanquist frequency, which is defined by uh, the multiple ways. It's defined by either sampling frequency, sampling frequency divided by two, okay? So which is essentially pi divided by Ts. This is called the Nanquist frequency. Another way, uh, if you ever do this body plot in MATLAB, you will notice this. So in MATLAB, if you do, for example, if G is a discrete time uh, transfer function, you do body, G. The result uh, is going to contain two plots. One is the magnitude plot and the other is phase plot. And over there in the MATLAB, in, in both plots, you will notice this. The plot is just going to end at some certain value. So for example, let's say the magnitude plot looks like this. So you will not get any further data after this frequency. This frequency is exactly the Nanquist frequency. Okay. So in an another way to interpret this is that the Nanquist frequency is the maximum frequency uh, you can evaluate for a transfer function, discrete time transfer function. 
Okay, that's the second interpretation. The third interpretation is that here, Shannon's sampling theorem says the key result is omega has to stay within within this range. So this is the key inequality in Shannon's sampling theorem. Okay, so here it's saying the frequency of a sinusoidal which you can distinguish in a discrete time domain. T, a pi over Ts is the maximum frequency you can distinguish in a discrete time system. Okay, so this is the Nanquist frequency. Here, this is the Nanquist frequency. Okay, so that's the, a, a quick review of the sampling theorem. Let's talk about another thing that's very interesting. Whenever we talk about sampling, we have to consider aliasing, okay? So the, the story goes like this. The sampling theorem tells us that we have to have this inequality, which we just revisited. So the frequency omega has to be uh, within this bound defined by the Nanquist frequency. If you, if you draw the continuous time S domain and the discrete time Z domain, you will notice, so when we evaluate the frequency response on the conti in the continuous time domain, we evaluate uh, by taking S equal to J omega. So we're taking values along this imaginary axis. And last time, you have seen that for discrete time systems, when we evaluate the frequency response of a discrete time transfer function, we, take, we do this. We do Z equal Ej omega times Ts, okay? And the algebra lo looks correct because omega, the frequency is in radians per second. So omega, the, the unit of omega is in radians per second. Oh, and over here, omega times Ts, Omega times Ts, the unit is in radians. So you see it's an angle, so we're evaluating along this unit circle for the discrete time frequency response, okay? So take a look at this. The continuous time J omega axis in the region of zero to pi over T. Which part in the unit circle does this line map to? say omega from zero to pi over Ts. Let's see, let me be uh, rigorous. This will be pi over Ts. Which region in the unit circle is this uh, omega frequency mapped to? So omega take the value of zero pi divided by Ts. What does omega times Ts take value? What kind of value does this guy take? So in that case, what, what about this Z? How does this, how does this Ej omega Ts map to? Hmm? So it's always, uh, the magnitude is always unit, unity. So the angle is gonna be from zero to pi, because it's pi divided by Ts times Ts. So it's going here, it's mapped to the, the first uh, half of the unit circle here, top part, okay? So in the same, same logic, the bottom line from zero to negative pi divided by Ts, it's gonna map to this, this time let me use dotted lines. It's gonna be mapped here. Okay? And it makes sense. Let's uh, consider another, let's recall what we learned last time. We, call, uh, we learned last time that the bilinear, bilinear transformation, what's the equation for bilinear tran uh, transformation? Can you guys derive it now? T 
take a moment to derive the bilinear transformation. This is a very common uh, equation in control engineering. So let's do this quick exercise. Anyone has an answer? What about starting from S equal to something? The standard bilinear transformation. <clears throat> S equal to what? Okay, so this is the standard bilinear transformation equation. And over here, you also see, uh, last time we analyzed that the unit, the origin in the continuous time domain, so S equal to zero is mapped to, so S equal to zero means Z has to be equal to one. Okay, so the origin in the, uni in the continuous time domain, S domain, is mapped to the, uh, one zero point in the Z domain. So you see, if you start from here going upwards, it's the same as you start here going uh, left, up left in the direction. And if you go down, it's here. You go uh, down left in the direction. Okay? Now, if, if I ask you, what should I do if I have this result and I want to want to cover as much as informa as much information as I can, as much frequency component as I can in the continuous time, what should I do? I want this range to cover a lot of frequency component. So I can make T S to be small, right? So this is exactly the same result as we see in Shannon sampling theory. We have to sample enough points to be able to do a good control design. A very interesting phenomenon is gonna happen very soon. If you think about it, is this range, is this range mapped to the unit circle? What do you think? Now take a look at here. Take a look at this new frequency range. <coughs> from pi divided by Ts to three pi divided by Ts. What does this guy map to? This line here, this solid black line mapped to in the discrete time case. So you're gonna consider Z equal to E J omega times Ts again. What does this guy map to? On the unit circle. So let's do that. So omega takes value of pi divided by Ts. Then this guy takes value of pi, between pi and three pi. What does this complex number get mapped to on the unit circle? What is e to the power of j pi? What about the other, the other point? E to the power of three J pi. It's here, right? 
So in between, it's going to go through the point of E, J, 2 pi, which is here. And if you think about it, the, it always has unit magnitude, so it always stays on this unit ball. You see exactly, it's going to get mapped to this unit circle, this boundary of this unit ball. Okay? So different frequency range get mapped to exactly the same uh, plot on the unit circle. So this is saying uh, the two mapping, the two mapping get mapped to the same unit circle. This is called aliasing. So uh, this actual component, the actual frequency component get mapped to the same you won't be able to tell if you just look at the discrete time domain. <coughs> Sorry. If you, if you look at only the unit ball in the discrete time domain, <coughs> you won't be able to tell whether it's mapped from here or it's mapped from here, you see? You can't tell. By looking at this, you cannot tell. That's uh, the aliasing problem. So let's do a quick example to let you see <coughs> what kind of result will happen. So, Let's consider uh, the sampling frequency is 1 divided by 60 seconds. So it means the sampling frequency is 60 hertz. In other words, the Nanquist frequency is uh, 30 hertz, which is 60 divided by 2. Okay? At this sampling frequency, I would like to sample, for example, in the first case, I would like to sample a 10 hertz signal. Okay? You can do the calculation. 10 hertz in this case. <coughs> 10 hertz in this case <coughs> is a 2 pi. Is 2 pi the, the frequency? Yeah, it's sufficient. So 10 hertz in uh, radians per second is 2 pi times 10 radians per second. And if you take a look at this, the Nanquist frequency <coughs> it's 30 hertz, which is uh, pi divided by T S. So let me finish up the full mathematics here. So the Nanquist frequency is this. You can verify that this 10 hertz sinusoidal signal stays exactly in this uh, Nanquist frequency bound. Okay? And if you just sample this continuous time signal, this is what you're going to get. So in discrete time, when you sample, you get, er you get measurement at every multiples of the sampling time, k times ts, which is k times 1 divided by 60. Okay? So you do this calculation, you're going to get 2 pi times 10 divided by 60 times k. This is the sampled signal, discrete time signal. Okay? You can verify it's 2 pi times 1 divided by 6k. Just a solid mathematics here. Nothing fancy. But the result is very interesting. If you have another signal, 70 hertz signal, and you can verify 70 hertz is no longer in this first bound. In this uh, 70 hertz is no longer uh, in this region, but it's beyond this frequency, pi divided by ts. Okay, and you see what will happen is this. For this continuous time signal at 70 hertz, when you sample it, same logic, T equals to K1 divided by 60. Okay, you're going to get 70 divided by 60. Okay, and here, sine, sine 2 pi, 70 divided by 60 is exactly equal to 2 pi, 1 divided by 6k, because you're going to get, yeah, it's very, I don't have enough space. But you just do this computation, very simple computation, you're going to see it. It's 2 pi, k plus 1 divided by 6k. So this is the result here. And if you factor out this k, if you do the, move out this k term here, you're going to get sine 2 pi k which is uh, uh, 
exactly equal to sine 2 pi 1 divided by 6k. Okay? So this very simple example, from this very simple example, you see continuous time, freq continuous time signal components, 10 hertz and 70 hertz, no difference in the discrete time sample signal. Okay, exactly the same sampled signal. So this is saying, this is raising a flag. This is saying, this is clearly undesired because we can't tell uh, from the sampled result, we can't tell the properties of the original signal. So what should I do in this case if I encounter this kind of situation? If I want to be able to recover both 10 hertz and 70 hertz, what should I do? Say that again? And then do what? Correct. So to solve this problem, there are two ways. Uh, one way is it's sort of the Kidding, it's sort of sewing from the root cause. So you sample faster. If you want to cover 10 hertz and 70 hertz, make sure your Nanquist frequency is larger than 70 hertz, okay? So in a more complete sentence, it means the sampling frequency should be high enough for depending on your control goal. So if a control goal has to go beyond 70 hertz, then your Nanquist frequency has to be go uh, beyond that. And it's usually a rule of sum that, the, it's general rule of sum over here. If your desired closed loop bandwidth for, continue, for, for, for a controlled system, feedback control system, uh, is let's say 100 hertz, then your Nanquist frequency usually has to be 10 times more than that or even 20 times more than that. So your Nanquist frequency has to be 1K in that case, 1K, 2K in that case. You have to sample that fast. This is a general rule of thumb, okay? Another way to avoid this aliasing problem is this. So I have 10 hertz and 70 hertz, and somehow I, I don't have enough, I, I don't have the hardware to do fast sampling time. I can't decrease this TS uh, significantly to be able to cover these two. So in that case, uh, what you do is you apply a low pass filter. So after you do the sampling, you apply a low pass filter whose cutoff frequency here, whose cutoff frequency here is less than 70. So you're gonna uh, remove the signal component here, 70 hertz signal component here. And then what's remaining is only the 10 hertz signal component. Okay? Mm -hmm. If, if that's the choice, if we don't, if we can't sample fast enough, then apply a low pass filter to filter out the components at 70 or whatever that's higher than uh, the hardware limit, okay? So, all right. Up, up till now, we have very quickly uh, analyzed the discretization. We have very quickly analyzed control practice, control engineering practice, which is uh, how you do discretization. Discretization. How you do discretization to approximate the continuous time controller. We talked about uh, bilinear transformation or extended, or sometimes called free wrap linear transformation to do this approximation. And then we have talked about this very important concept of sampling and the aliasing in practice. Okay? 
there are much, much more. Actually, this is a very brief uh, go through of this discrete time uh, sampling and NDS in uh, theory. In, I think in WE department, they have more focused classes talking about these cases. And if you're interested, you can take a further look over there. Okay. I will skip the example uh, on the notes you have. You can take a look at this uh, example, but it's not central for what we're going to discuss next. What I want to discuss next is this one. Uh, it's called LQG loop transfer recovery. So in short, an LQG LTR. This is a very useful concept. And uh, not only is it very useful, but the, the story of how the theorem was discovered was, is also a very interesting story. So I want you guys to, in this, in this lecture, I want you guys to make sure that you follow the big pictures. This is my main goal. I want you to have a clear understanding of the big picture of the theorem and sort of see, sort of imagine how it was discovered in, in the early years. Okay. Let's talk about by start. I talk about LQG LTR starting with some review of what we have learned so far. We have learned. We have talked about this for a couple of times. We have learned LQ, which is optimal state feedback control, and we have a lot of nice properties over there. We have guaranteed robust stability and the basic assumptions of controllability and observability. We have also talked about common filter, which is another very, very useful result in uh, control engineering. <clears throat> it's for optimal state estimation. And we have very good properties because of the duality between LQ and common filter. And later, we combine these two by the theorem LQG. And afterwards, we talked about frequency domain loop shaping design some of the principles and implementations. Okay? Uh, if you started homework, the, the current homework, which is due next Tuesday. Oh, by the way, I want to postpone, postpone the due date of this current homework to next Thursday because uh, we're going to have midterm next Tuesday. So I'll postpone. I'll make an announcement. I'll ask the GSI to make an announcement about this. So... Uh, <coughs> Going back here, by after postponing the homework due date, uh, think about, yeah, okay, I started with here. So if you do the homework, I forgot which problem, but there's one problem talking about the stability robustness of LQG problem, which is uh, in the sense that if you have uncertainties in the plant, what kind of properties of LQG will come out? And if you have finished that problem, you will see that uh, the nice, robust stability in LQ, the good gain margins and phase margins, will be lost in LQG. That's a result of that problem. Okay? So the message of that is LQG is not a robust control design. Now, what we're going to talk about today is something very interesting. If you look at it at the beginning, you will think this is an LQG problem. But if you look at this carefully enough, you will see later it's not, a, it's not a technically an LQG. It's something else, something, something that can solve this robustness issue of LQG problem. Okay? So you might find it a little bit difficult to start with at the beginning, but I guarantee you it's going to be very useful result you see in the future, whether you do your research or uh, for other classes. So think about the continuous time stationary LQG problem. You have this, a common filter, which is going to provide you the optimal state estimation. And you have this uh, state feedback gain, K, which is coming from the LQ problem, which is coming from the LQ problem. So it's a state 
estimated state feedback design. Okay. Now, if you take a more detailed look by partitioning the block diagram like this, okay, I'm cutting the loop right ahead of the plant and right after the plant. If I ask you what's, what does the controller look like if I consider this from starting from this point, point one to point two here. If I ask you the controller from point one, the transfer function from point one to location two, is this transfer function a multiple input, multiple output transfer function, or a single input, single output one? Let's say, let's say the plant Y and U, they are both, let's say the plant is single input, single output. Single input, single output, right? Keep this in mind, keep what you have answered in mind. It's gonna be really uh, useful observation. So because of that, I can simply evaluate if I consider this is point one and this is point two. Then I can, I can obtain a equivalent single input single input, single output transfer function. So this is the example here. Uh, I'm assuming single input, single output case, but uh, later we'll extend this result here. Okay, look at this guy. There's got to be some way to do this equi equivalent, obtain this equivalent transfer function, and it's very easy to do so. You just uh, write down the equation for the Kalman filter, which is this. So this is the continuous time Kalman filter equation. You can recognize the structure here. So it's a, this is the arrow, and this is the system dynamics. Okay, and here the equation for the control law is going to be u <coughs> equals negative k x hat. Okay, so doing some very simple algebra, you can see. Look at these two equations. You can obtain the transfer function from y to u, okay? Regard y, which is the point here, as the input to the controller, and u is the output of this controller. What is the transfer function between y and u here? That's correct. Huh, interesting, you guys hesitated so much. Maybe you're not sure. How many of you know what's the transfer function? One. How many of you doesn't know? You see, all of you are not sure. I think you know. So if I, so if I introduce another notation, you definitely know. I don't believe you don't know. If I introduce another notation, I call eta as the x hat. And uh, I have a to dot equals a minus b k minus f c a to plus f y t. What's the transfer function between y and u? To make it more obvious, I'm going to put this equation on the bottom. u t equal to negative k a to t. You have to tell me. Why to you? Why to you? Yeah, someone is seeing it. C minus K SI minus A plus BK, right? What was F, right? So, yeah, you know, you just, uh, you don't want to tell me. Okay, so this is the transfer function g from y to u here. 
okay? So I do a little bit, I massage the transfer function a little bit, a little, just a little bit to make it in a negative feedback loop. So if I do negative feedback, this is y, so this is negative y. So I have to obtain something between negative y and u. So I have to add a negative sign ahead of this. So g negative y to u is k si minus inverse f. Okay, so this is the transfer function. This is the equivalent feedback transfer function. Okay, so if the plant is single input, single output, then this guy is gonna be single input, single output. If the plant is gonna be, uh, let's see whether I do the more complicated case. I think so far so good. So we'll assume the plant is single input, single output case for the remainder of the lecture, okay? Now, this gives you a, a, some, some sort of different look of the LQG problem, okay? You have, this is the LQG formulation. This is the equivalent transfer function over there. Someone look at this, and he look at it very carefully. Then he discovered something very interesting. So, a little bit history of this LQG LTR uh, is as follows. It's discovered by a professor currently in Caltech University. Uh, his name is John Doy. He got his master's degree in MIT at probably in the 70s. Over there, he, pro he must have learned LQ and common filter. And somehow, he looked at the problem very carefully and he obtained this result. Obtained this very, it seems to be, at the first, at the first look, it seems to be totally irrelevant with, uh, to LQ or common filter. So he discovered this, a theorem, loop transfer recovery theorem. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, he made this observation, he de derived this when he was a master student. And uh, if you search the literature, this is very uh, popular design. It, it was worse, once very popular in control engineering. Almost everyone knows it. So regardless of whether now, what's the situation now, now it's still popular. I want you guys to uh, understand it because the story behind it, it's, I think is amazing. Okay, all right. Okay, I, I made an extension here. So S, originally I said it's single input, single output. So S can also be a transfer function matrix, multiple input, multiple output. So I'm gonna assume the uh, dimension of this transfer function is M by M. So I'm, a, I'm a extending from single input, single output case to a square. This is a square system, M by M, square system. If this transfer function has only Minimum phase, zeros, transmission zeros. So transmission zeros is another word for, uh, in the, in the multi-dimensional case, for another word for zeros, okay? So minimum phase here, this, let me talk a little bit about minimum phase. So if I say minimum phase zero, if all the zeros are stable, by stable here, I mean, as usual, on the left up plane of the uh, continuous time S domain. So this is S domain, S plane. And in the discrete time case, minimum phase zeros means uh, they stay within the unit circle. Okay, that's minimum phase. Non-minimum phase are the zeros here on the right half plane or outside the unit circle. Okay, so just, that's just a, some terminology to call these zeros. So the theorem says, if the transfer function of the plant, it has this nice locations of zeros, then we have, from the last, from, from the last slide, if you recall, last time we have derived the transfer function of GC, which is K SI minus A plus BK plus F C inverse F, and the transfer function of the plant 
CSI minus A inverse B. Okay? So do this algebra, write down the open loop transfer function from here to here, from, let's say, from here to here. The open loop transfer function from here to here. You're going to get this. So it's going to be the transfer function of the uh, controller times the transfer function of the plant. Okay? If you do this computation and you followed whatever we have dis uh, uh, discussed, then under certain conditions, this seemingly very, very long transfer function has all these matrices inside. It's going to converge to a very innocent looking transfer function. You see, it's very simple. C S I minus A times F. Part of it, the first part here uh, comes from the plant. And the second half here comes from the F matrix, the gain in the common filter example. Okay? Looks very simple, very innocent. But we'll soon discover that it has a lot of nice properties. So this convergence is under the conditions that you do the LQ problem and you select the cost function in the LQ as this. Okay? It's X transpose C transpose CX plus rho. Okay, this rho will take a play a role here uh, for the cost on U, the control input. So the theorem says if you started to not care so much about the magnitude of the about the cost of the control, as you reduce rho, this very long transfer function, open loop transfer function is going to converge to this transfer function. Okay? Under the common filter and LQ formulation. Okay? So you see, at first sight, you have no idea how he came up with this. He made this observation somehow during his when, when he's studying the master, when he's obtaining the master degree. And he proved it very nicely. We're going to do the proof in the, on Thursday's lecture. Yes? Where? Here? So, uh, here, someone asked, the, what, is, what is role playing a role here? So, it's saying, if I reduce role, what does reduce role mean in this LQ problem? It means we don't care much about the cost on the control. So that means we can apply the degree of freedom in the control is quite large. We don't have much constraint on the control. Yeah, that's called uh, cheap control, I think, in the LQ formulation. So it means the control are very cheap. We don't need to uh, put a lot of weight on the control. Mm. So it's saying, if I don't, if I, if the control is very cheap, then as I reduce rho, this convergence happens. Okay. So we will do the proof, as I mentioned, we'll do the proof next time. But now you see, this is the result the theorem tells us. This originally looking very complicated, not exactly complicated, this very uh, big closed loop system. Let me ask, if the system, if the system plant, the order, the, 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 number, the number of states is n, what's the order of uh, the controller? Someone said it's 2n. So let's put a question mark here because we're not sure yet. There's another candidate, n. Yeah, this actually it's some it's a little bit not obvious and it's not on the reader, so not in the reader. So it might take a while to see this. But look at the transfer function, look at the controller. This is the controller. From here you you tell me what's the order of the controller. It's n. Right? So it's the number of states of x hat, which is n. So here, it's saying for this originally uh, n plus n order of closed loop system, 
if you do this kind of uh, convergence by choosing this row like this, what's the order of this new closed loop system? It's going to be n, right? Because that's the order of the states here. So this two n order system is going to reduce to an n order system under the LQ and common filter formulations. So now that's the observation, but that doesn't still we are one step one step to go to talk about control design. So can someone give me a suggestion? If I want to do control design, if I have this nice result here, what kind of control design will be possible? I can choose F, if I have the freedom to choose F, I can choose F such that this transfer function has very nice properties. And that is the case we will see very soon because it comes from the common filter. So it's going to have some very nice properties. Okay? So we can choose F. That's the co uh, key concept of design. We can choose F such that this loop has very nice properties. So because of that, this loop is called uh, the target feedback loop. It's the loop we want the system to approach to. Okay? So uh, some of the key concepts are so, uh, so far. Uh, regard LQG as an output, as an out, as an output feedback controller. That's the first step we did. And then, because of this convergence, we can design F such that this target feedback loop has a good loop shape. By good loop shape, I mean uh, what we discuss, what we discussed last time. The magnitude response has to have this uh, very nice shape. It's a uh, low frequency. It's lower bounded, and at high frequency, it's upper bounded. So this is just one example. It can be much more complicated, but uh, the idea is we can have some design for this. And then we just design the LQG LTR to let the original big closed loop system to converge to this one. Okay? Now, this is a little bit, uh, we, we need a little bit time to, di to digest these two sentences. Okay, so now, think about it. This kind of design is not a conventional control problem. Okay, because in a conventional optimal control with common filter, where does F come from? The Riccati equation, right? We don't have the choice to design F in a conventional uh, optimal control problem. But this is not the case here. We want to have some design of F over here. Okay? Now if you think about it, even go one step further, this is not even a stochastic control design method. By that I mean, think about it, if we are talking about stochastic control design, the system is going to have, need to have the noise, the W or V going into the system. All right? But did we mention anything like that? Here, right? We just discovered, we just uh, obtained this transfer function, and then after some algebra, we arrive at this. So it's not a conventional stochastic control method. That's why at the beginning of the class, I told you that LQG LTR, it's at the first look, it, it looks something that's interesting but strange. But later you will see uh, it has beautiful properties inside. Okay? So if so far so good, I want to talk about this target feedback loop. I said this is the target. Uh, we want this loop to have good properties. And it turns out it will be if we design the common filter cleverly here. Okay. So uh, first of all, let me remind you that this is not a traditional common filter problem. This is called a fictitious common filter problem. And the reason is what we just discussed. For a conventional common filter, we have the noise properties, W and V, which is going to give us F. So we don't have choice on F. F comes from the Riccati equation. But in the fictitious common filter problem, okay, we want to design, here, here is this key sentence, select the noise properties to get a desired F. Okay? So interpret this very carefully. By that I mean, 
uh, we can design if this is the system in common filter. We can design the proper, we can choose the properties of W and V here. So as a, as a convenient procedure, we can, we can choose uh, the fictitious noise. Now they are all fictitious noises. These are not noises going into the plant, but a fictitious noise for us to obtain a desired F. So keep that in mind. So we can introduce these fictitious properties where the variance, covariance of W is I identity and the covariance of V is gonna be mu times identity, okay? And then if you follow the common filter procedure, we're gonna obtain this. This is the equations, Riccardi equations and uh, common filter gain for the fictitious common filter problem. I keep saying that to, to remind you that it's not a true common filter, it's a fictitious common filter, okay? So we can have all the choices. We can choose mu to make this F to have nice properties, okay? And keep another, take another look here, L. This is also not the matrix B in the actual system, but it's uh, something we can design to make this F matrix has nice properties, okay? So this is, this is where it starts to get a little bit difficult to understand. The concept of a fictitious common filter is not a true uh, common filter for the original system, but it's something, someone had a question? Where? Here? Oh, this is the uh, direct delta function. So let me see. Delta tau equals to one if tau is zero and it's zero otherwise. Oh, that's the definition. Identity. I identity, yeah. Okay? All right. So I said, this is what I said. I said, this loop can have nice properties we de if we design everything very carefully. And here is one of the very nice properties uh, this fictitious common filter problem has. Now, uh, let's go through this. For this fictitious common filter problem, uh, you, can, you can take a look at the notes. The return difference equation for this fictitious common filter looks as follows. Okay, so on the left-hand side, left half side, left-hand side, GF equals to C SI minus A inverse F, and on the right-hand side, phi S equals to SI minus A inverse. Okay, so just a review, the return difference equation. On the right-hand side, this guy is the open loop transfer function from W to Y, right? C SI minus A inverse times L, okay? So on the right-hand side, these are the open loop transfer functions. And on here is the closed loop properties of the common filter loop. That's the intuition for the return difference equation, okay? If you, uh, if you believe no typo is here, then something very nice is gonna come out of it. So we discussed the singular values in the last lecture. What will, yeah, I can just follow here. From this return difference equation, we can compute the singular value of this i plus gf, replace s with j omega. We can compute the singular value of this, okay? So which is gonna be the square root of the eigenvalue of this guy. So I'm essentially using Singular value of a matrix M equals to square root of the eigenvalue of M times M transpose. Here, okay? So it's gonna be the square root of this eigenvalue here. And then, 
if I use the return difference equality here, I need to consider the eigenvalue of I m plus one divided by mu times uh, Z phi j omega L C phi negative j omega L transpose. Can someone tell me what's the eigenvalue for this guy, for this big matrix here? So I claim that it equals one plus the eigenvalue of one divided by mu C phi j omega L C phi negative j omega L transpose. Can you see that? The eigenvalue of I plus a matrix equals one plus the eigenvalue of this matrix. This is a some result in linear algebra. Let me know if you want me to prove it. Okay, so some of you seems confused. So let me see, uh, review. Uh, I will do the case, <clears throat> I'll, do the, I'll do the simple case. So if M is the metric, then I'll do this very easy case. Eigenvalue of uh, identity plus M equals one plus the eigenvalue of M. This is a result from the spectral mapping theorem in linear algebra. Hmm. Some, I see most of you are writing this down. Hmm, let me see. So interrupt me if, I, if I'm writing down anything that you, you have never seen before. So because the ma matrix M is, a, is symmetric, I can do symmetric eigenvalue decomposition to write down M as a summation of its eigenvalues, lambda M, times a bunch of rank one matrices, I will use U. Yeah, probably I can use U. U, I, I, I will rewrite it. So summation of I, lambda I, U, I, U, I, transpose. Okay, I can do symmetric eigenvalue decomposition. So this way, essentially, I'm getting uh, U, suppose all the eigenvalues are distinct. Then I can get, suppose the matrix is dimension N. I can get this, okay? Then I plus M, over here, this U, are, this U is unitary matrix, meaning U, U transpose equals identity. So this is the properties of symmetric eigenvalue decomposition. So because of this, I get I plus M equals to U, U transpose plus U, this big diagonal matrix, U transpose, okay? And here, I get U times one plus lambda one, and then all the way to one plus Lambda M. Okay. And then, uh, by analogy, the, the eigenvalue of the matrix M are sitting here, these diagonal elements of this matrix here. So, in the same, in the same way, the eigenvalue of I plus M are sitting in the diagonal elements of this matrix here. So that's why the eigenvalues of I plus M is one plus the eigenvalue of M. Okay, so if you have never seen this before, uh, this is not a course about linear algebra, but a course about control design. So it's sufficient if you know the results here. Okay, so up till now, we have seen 
by using the result we just derived. The eigenvalue of I plus this matrix equals one plus the eigenvalue of this matrix, okay? Now, look at this guy. I hope you can see this. The eigenvalue of this guy equals the square of the singular value. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take out one divided by mu first. I'm gonna take out this first. And then inside, I'm gonna have the, yeah. Inside, it's gonna be a singular value of this matrix here. Okay, because singular value squared are the, eigen, are the eigenvalues. So uh, that's the property of the singular value. So here, I talked this much uh, just to re arrive at this equation here. This final conclusion is that the singular value of this guy, this close to property, is gonna be equal to this guy. Square root of one plus some singular value of some, uh, some singular value squared. So this property is always non-negative. Because of that, take the square root here, it's gonna be always larger than or equal to one. So that's the final conclusion. Uh, I have copied it here. The final conclusion is that the singular value of this guy is larger than or equal to one. So to get some understanding of this result here, what will be the case if the system is, uh, what will be the case if GF is single input, single output? Then the singular value of this guy, so this becomes a scalar, see that? This becomes one. So the left hand side is one plus G, F, J, omega, okay? If you recall the target feedback loop in the LTR, LQG LTR problem, C, S, I, minus A, inverse F, with uh, S equal to J, omega. Hmm. If you recall this, <clears throat> what is, for example, what is the sensitivity function for this closed loop system? So the conclusions are this guy larger than or equal to one. What's the sensitivity function for this closed loop system? S J omega equal to one divided by one plus gf j omega, okay? <coughs> this actually should be the, the absolute value here. Because on the left, side, left half side, left side is a complex number, so you have to take the magnitude to compare it with a, a scalar. So if this, if this is the result from, from, from here, from what we have derived, okay? If this holds, what can you tell me about the magnitude of the sensitivity function? This should be very quick. Right? So th this is an amazing result if you think about it. What does this say? The sensitivity function is characterizing the transfer function, the dynamics between the output disturbance to the output, right? If you derive the uh, algebra, this transfer function is also the dynamics between R and the feedback uh, error. So we have mentioned uh, two lectures ago, we want this sensitivity function to be small. Right? But we have also mentioned one thing, that S plus J is always one, okay? 
So it's a fundamental law we can't break. But this result is so nice. This guy is saying uh, disturbances, disturbances at all frequency, at any frequency omega is attenuated. Right? This is the this is what, what it means, this equation here. At any frequency, the disturbance is going to be attenuated because of the magnitude of this. It's not amplified. Yeah, it, the, the correct, the more rigorous way is to say it's not amplified. Okay, so the magnitude is never possible to be larger than one. So no disturbance will be amplified, which is very nice property. Okay. So this is a conclusion here. We have discussed a simple input, single output case. But for the multiple input, multiple output case, uh, things are the same. You just put a, a maximum single value ahead. But the conclusion is the same. No disturbance is amplified at any frequency, which is a very, very nice property. Okay? And there's a second property. Uh, this property requires a little bit more algebra. So uh, it's sufficient that, that you understand the conclusion here. The derivation is not required. So it says, uh, if you evaluate the complementary sensitivity function, the singular value of the complementary sensitivity function, it equals the maximum singular value of I plus S because of the fundamental uh, feedback limitation S plus I, S plus T equals I, okay? So it's the maximum singular value of S, one identity minus S. Now, if the singular value of S uh, had it, has these properties, then uh, this requires a little bit algebra. But the conclusion is that this guy is bounded. This guy is bounded. And the bound happens to be one uh, in this case. If you want to know the derivation, come to my office hour. It's a little bit more involved. That's for eigen, if it's eigenvalue, then perfectly fine. But this is single value. Yeah, so a little bit more algebra. Come to my office always, you wanna know. But the, the result, the, the derivation is not important. The result is it's gonna be bounded. And if you recall the robust stability condition for the system, uh, this is the derivation from two lectures ahead. The robust stability condition is this the singular value. The maximum singular value of this guy has to be less than one, okay? So in this case, uh, if you know this is bounded, if you know it has an upper bound, then you will know that this guy also has, if, if this guy is small enough, then this equality will always be satisfied. That's just the, the result is more important than the derivation. So the result is we can have guaranteed close to stability under certain conditions, and that's all. Okay? Uh, yes? Mm. It's not, yeah. So that's a little bit, that's additional thinking you have to make to understand everything. It's not optimal control anymore. This will be, uh, in this case is something different. Uh, you don't have the guaranteed phase margin, gain margin in LQ or common filter problem. You have something different. The design logic, let me bring back the picture here. The design logic is as follows. So first of all, you design a target feedback loop. And you can design this target feedback loop in a way that it has certain nice margins by designing F. And then afterwards you go back and see when the system is gonna approximate this target feedback loop. So gain margins and phase margins in this sense are different compared to LQ. Yeah, now it's totally loop shaping, okay?
In this case, it's a steady state. So the, the order is still n. The order is still n. So that's why, so think about what, what is really needed to do this design. What is really needed is just the common, the, the LQ gain, k here, all right? I can compute that out of this Riccati equation. But after I compute it, it's never needed. Yeah, it's, it's a steady state. It's a, it's a constant gain feedback. Yeah, yeah common field has order. Okay. Uh, okay, that's the end of today's lecture. I hope you got the full pictures of the LQG, LTR. Uh, some announcement is my office hour today will be a little bit changed. Uh, I'll have office hour from now to, to 10. And then I will have this afternoon's office hour uh, I'll have from one to two, okay? So this is for Tuesday and Thursday this week. Uh, some change of office hours, okay? That's all, see you on Thursday.